five seconds behind on the city channel, not the city channel, but on the web, the website, city website. The, the city channel is not broadcasting either. It will be in a minute. Oh, okay. All right, good. All right, I got that page up. All right, there's, okay, TV just came on. Okay. Ingenuity. <laughs> okay, you're okay. All right. Please start the recording. I'd like to call the City of Las Vegas Historic Preservation Commission for December the 14th, 2022. For the record, uh, the time is 12.26. We uh, uh, have been working with, uh, well, uh, first let's call the roll and determine if we have a quorum. Thank you. Chair Stodal. Present. Vice Chair Laramie. Commissioner Levine. Jack, you there? Commissioner Levine. Hmm. Commissioner Levine. He said he was turning his on mute, so he's got to probably get back to. Jack, are you on mute? Let's continue with the roll call and okay. come back to Jack. Commissioner Beck. Present. Commissioner Hotchkiss. Excused. Commissioner Serfas. Present. Commissioner Cosgrove. Here. Commissioner Palancar. Here. Commissioner Palacios. Here. Commissioner Moody. Can you say here? Are you able to say here? One more time. I can hear him. Do you want to put him on speaker? Uh, okay, one more time. Commissioner Moody, present by cell, by telephone. Thank you. Perfect, thanks. Commissioner Perdue, present. Commissioner Seabrunt? Here. Commissioner Gillespie? Excused. Go back to Jack. Commissioner Levine? Oh, yes, I'm here. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. All right. And thank the court's office for uh, working through all this with us as well as the as city attorney. We had a challenge uh, with the system. Uh, so the system we are using are three cell phones that are recording the uh, the voices and allowing the uh, the city or the uh, HPC commissioners to hear the proceedings uh, via cell phones. Um, so this is a a first uh, as we move forward uh, with the next item on the agenda. Uh, are we in compliance with the open meeting law? Yes, we are. All right, again, stole off for the record. Item three, public comment. Comment during this portion of the agenda must be limited to matters on the agenda for action. If you wish to be heard, come forward. Give your name for the record. The amount of discussion as well as the amount of time any single speaker is allowed may be limited. Is there anybody in the audience at this point that uh, wants to speak? Hearing and seeing none, uh, thank you. Then move on to agenda item four. Uh, chair does not have any announcements at this point. Item five, possible action item, the final minutes by reference of the regular meeting of the HPC on October the 26th, 2022. Uh, look for a motion to approve. I'll make a I motion to. Commissioner Surface, I'll make a motion to approve those minutes. We have a motion for the discussion. Anybody on the telephone, uh, the board members? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries unanimously with the chair voting in, with those that have voted. For the record, we have nine members that are 
attending this meeting in one form or another. Let us move on then to the next item on the agenda, which is item 6, 22-0689-HPC1, discussion for possible action regarding approval of a certificate of appropriateness application for a parameter metal fence replacement at Woodlawn Cemetery, located at 1500 Las Vegas Boulevard North. Dr. Seabrand. Thank you, Seabrand, for the record. So the Woodlawn Cemetery is um, on uh, the, actually all three registers. So this has also been sent to SHPA for their um, feedback. And this fence, this body was given an update on this. I think it was last year that this fence would need to be replaced. And now it is the point where the replacement is ready to move forward. And um, Jason Anderson with Public Works is going to be giving us the information on the design that will replace the current fence. Please, welcome. Thank you, Chair. Fellow commissioners, good morning. Uh, my name is Jason Anderson. I work for the Department of Public Works, specifically for our real estate team. Woodlawn Cemetery is one of the properties that we manage pretty closely. I was here about a year and a half ago with Jerry Walker, the then Director of Operations and Maintenance, to kind of give you a status update on the property as well as discuss the fencing. So I'm back here today, we, we have moved forward. We received $2.5 million in the capital improvement budget to replace the fence uh, for the entire perimeter. And so we have just put together a design. And so I thought I would come here today to share that with the committee and kind of solicit some feedback. Uh, this is a picture, a very bright picture of the current fence that is out there. So you can kind of see the design of what currently exists if you're not overly familiar with it. The, one of the primary problems with this fencing are those concrete pillars on the ends. They're very, very expensive. Uh, they're also custom made and they're difficult to have made. The fence, I estimate back on some research going back to the 70s, so it's pushing at least 50 years old, possibly older at this point. It has suffered significant damages throughout the property. Uh, but due to, when I was here with uh, Jerry Walker at the time, he had a number of ideas regarding the design of the fence. For simplicity, we will be keeping it mostly the same. Uh, however, we will just be upgrading kind of the standards of the fence, the strength of the fence, the quality, that sort of thing. I thought it was important. We, we played around with a few different ideas. But I thought it was important to kind of just keep it simple as it is. It kind of has that historical look to it. Um, we are going to add sort of the, the plan is to add those sort of custom tips to the top of the, the pillars. And then the primary thing to help with the structure of the fence is the middle post. We're going to install four inch square post with each one, which will basically cut it down to a five and a half foot panel. They're typically 11 feet wide. So that middle post should help significantly with the structure of the fence. There, um, I'm sure you guys are aware, there's quite a bit of vandalism and stuff in that area, so the fence takes a little bit of a beating from time to time. Uh, we're doing a very similar project to Durango Hills Golf Course, where we'll be doing the same thing with four inch square posts. And that should hopefully help with the stability of the fence going forward. Uh, one of the big issues with the strength of the fence is connecting it to those concrete pillars. Uh, we are not planning to replace all the pillars because it would be astronomical, uh, but I am estimating probably having to replace about 20% of them. There's a total of 517. So we're looking at probably 100 of those. So that 2.5 million is going to go pretty quick. But that's. That's all I have for the fencing. I just wanted to come and show you. This is sort of the design we're going with. It will feature two top, two top posts. They'll be about an inch and a half thick. Um, and then the big, the big addition will be that middle square post, which sure. should help. Um, any questions uh, on the telephone from our board members? Any questions for the board members here in the uh, council chambers? Yep. Please. I have a question. Will the old um, posts all be painted so that the entire surrounding fence will be maintained and look new? So the, are you referring to the concrete pillars? 
Yes. Those will not be painted as part of this project. Um, they're just sort of like a concrete gray uh, for the most part. The fence will be black, uh, which is the current color, but there's no plan to paint the pillars at this point. But the old pillars, per the picture that we had, uh, the prior picture, looked like, no, the one before that. It's looks like that pillar needs to be painted quite badly. That, that's probably one that will be replaced. Uh, that is from a vehicle accident. So as I mentioned, we'll probably replace, cl give or take, 100 of them altogether. But as you can tell, they're, they're very old. They're, they're pretty outdated. Um, we can go back and sort of stain them, possibly have them painted as well. But it is not a part of, at this time, we're only focused on the iron. We are replacing all of the wrought iron fence, all 517 panels. So it'll be completely new iron out there. And my last question is, will you be ordering extra finials because they have a way of disappearing, falling off? What, uh, can you define finials? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I am aware of that. So there is a fence across the street um, as part of the I guess it's the main street. I uh, know the plaza property. It has uh, fencing right here next to the city hall parking garage. They are sort of custom molded at the top. So that is what we're going to request from the vendor so that it is one continuous piece rather than the little pickets. You'll see in another picture we have those sort of pickets that are placed at other parts of the cemetery and they do go missing. And I do not want to replace a thousand of those every year. So. So the reason, I stole off for the record, the reason for the, what are we calling those pickets? They're pickets, pickets. yeah, that's kind of what we refer is, to them is, is that for uh, design or it's for a security element? It, well, it does play a little bit of both, uh, but it was mostly just, I thought, to add sort of to the artistic display of it. Well, I, I want to preface or end my, my, my comments by, it, it's the Woodlawn Cemetery uh, it's so important to not only people that reside there and their families, uh, but also the history of, of, of our community. They're mm -hmm. significant. They're all significant, but there's a couple of Civil War veterans that are next to each other. There's all kinds of different things that are there that make this an important piece of history. And it seemed that the city was going in one direction, but that direction has changed 180 degrees over the last year or so, and a lot of attention is being paid to this important facility. So uh, thank your team and, and, and all the work that, uh, that, is, that is being done. Also seems that that area has been stabilized up, up, a bit. I used to work down the street at Channel 3, and there were campgrounds all the way up on Foremaster all the way to it. And that's been fixed and taken care of and, and the human beings that, that, we, that are there in that area that need those services seem to be a little bit more toward the main street. Are you feeling a stabilization of that area a bit? Uh, yes, Chair. Uh, certainly over the past 12 months, it seems like the area around immediately surrounding Woodlawn has certainly stabilized, as you mentioned. Part of that, from what I know, is that they have closed the entrance to the four master resource area. Okay. And so, as you mentioned, uh, most of the immediate <coughs> environment has shifted towards Main Street. Uh, Woodlawn obviously has no control over that environment, uh, but it has certainly improved tremendously over the last year. And there's a few other sort of security measures we have taken to help protect the property that I'll go over in my next item, which will be an update in general on this cemetery. Further questions, comments? Yes. Please. Helen Carr, for the record. Um, on the top, the pickets, the new ones, <clears throat> I noticed they're rounded. And if you're having trouble with the vandalism, don't you want them sharper and pointed to keep people from climbing over? I mean, it would make more sense for vandalism and... Uh, well, I mean, Commissioner, I mean, I don't necessarily want people to get injured at the property. Uh, what, they're going to injure the property? 
<laughs> the purpose uh, is to keep the people out. Pe Not people can certainly climb over the fence. The concrete pillars are barely six feet tall, so they. I mean, if you really want to get into the property, you will find a way into the property. The tips certainly will help deter some people when they first take a glance at it, uh, but that the, they they will find a way in. All right, if there are no further questions, we will then move on to the next agenda uh, item. Chair, oh, no, Chair, sorry, sorry uh, two things. Um, see, Brent, for the record, uh, Commissioner Moody did write in. He said he's having a difficult time hearing the presenter. It's very garbled. That may be due to some of our technical difficulties, but he did read the backup material and his he would vote in favor of this application. So this is a voting item, so you, we do need a vote, please, sir. Right. All right, we look for a motion on the, uh, the agenda item. Uh, which is to uh, uh, accept the design and the, and the plans and the expenditure of, of, of the funds at Woodlawn Cemetery. Commissioner Surface, I'll make a motion to approve uh, what the chairman has just entered into the record. Further discussion by the chair or the, by the board? General public? Commissioners on, on telephone. Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 <laughs> those opposed? Motion carries unanimously with the chair, as it shows, is voting in favor of this motion. So, thank you. Let's move on to agenda item number seven then, which is 22-0690, HPC one report by Jason Anderson, management analyst, analyst two with Public Works uh, Department regarding the update on Little Lawn Cemetery located at 1500 Las Vegas Boulevard North. Welcome back. Thank you, Chair. Good to be back. Uh, so I just wanted to give, uh, while I'm here, I figured I would provide an update on the property in general. Uh, Woodlawn was kind of looking a little rough for a little while. Uh, in May of 2020, we amended, we entered a new operating contract with the third party operator of the cemetery. That contract shifted a lot of responsibility back to the city of Las Vegas, which is where my office got involved. And then in July of this year, we amended that contract even further to shift more maintenance and landscaping responsibilities to the city. So I just wanted to kind of show you some of the projects we've done in the last year and a half. We've really accomplished quite a bit throughout 2021 and 2022 in terms of renovating and in rehabbing the property. So one project we did this summer was landscaping the street of Four Master Lane. Uh, as you can see on the left, it was just sort of dirt, overgrown grass and weeds. It was just kind of bare. Uh, so we have gone in and installed a bunch of decorative landscape rock, numerous cactuses and other various plants, as well as some drip irrigation. And we connected that irrigation to the cemetery so it, we're able to control it. Uh, we, they, we did this all the way from Bruce and Foremaster down to where the landscaping sort of turns into sidewalk, uh, which is about three quarters of the way down towards Las Vegas Boulevard. So it was a pretty significant addition. Uh, it looks really nice. If you've been on Foremaster lately, uh, it's definitely a step up from just sort of the rough dirt and patch that was out there. Uh, this is the interior of the office. The operator moved out in the summer of 21. And so there was a lot of cleanup and outdated interior decorating in there. So we went in and revamped it pretty significantly. We replaced all the flooring. Uh, we also have a roof replacement that is uh, in the midst of being done on the property because of severe leakage, unfortunately. The roof's pretty old. Uh, but inside, we did quite a bit. We did a lot of painting. There's been some electrical work done. Mostly work that just has sort of been neglected 
over the years and now that we're in there. We do have a full-time city employee now stationed at Woodlawn. So he is there four days a week, essentially serving as a site supervisor. So that provides a constant city presence, which is very nice, very helpful to my office. And he <coughs> has now occupied the office and kind of maintains it. And we have constant janitorial and all sorts of stuff going on in there. So it's being treated pretty well. Uh, we also suffered some window damage to the building. There has been a history of people throwing rocks in that area. Uh, we also had an individual throw an actual boulder through the window. So uh, we did install kind of this like poly security cover to all the windows. Uh, we'll see how, how it holds up. But this is the exterior of the office. The landscaping had really just gone uh, pretty bad. So we ripped it out. Uh, on the right, you will see a concrete patio. Uh, <coughs> earlier this year, we actually replaced that as well. And this is what it looks like now. So we did a similar thing, just sort of desert landscaped it out, really cleaned it up. Um, one of the big things, obviously, it's a cemetery. It's 40 acres large. That's a lot of water. Uh, one of the big things is trying to minimize the, ma the l ongoing maintenance and water usage at the property. So we kind of go with the simple sort of desert landscape. It makes sense here in the city of Las Vegas. On the right, you can see the concrete patio that we also resurfaced. We did a Cherokee red, which matches the veterans roundabout in the property that we also redid about two years ago. This is the east entrance on Foremaster, kind of near Foremaster and Bruce. Uh, this did not require a complete demo and rebuild. The wall was structurally sound, so we just kind of gave it a facelift and kind of redid it. As you can see, it was poorly maintained. Now that we have a uh, city presence in there, it's constantly being cleaned up and, and maintained. This matches the entrance we also redid on Las Vegas Boulevard, so we kind of kept those the same. Uh, we do have a current project for the main center entrance on Four Master Lane. That one is still in the design phase, but I will be back to kind of show you that when we get to it. Here's kind of a picture of what some of the gardens were looking like being maintained or not maintained, as you can see, as well as the continuous fence damages that we suffer. And here was a look from this summer. So we have, in the last year and a half, replaced every single sprinkler on the property, which is about 1,100 sprinklers. We replaced every single water valve, which is 148 water valves. We've installed numerous water lines and other significant irrigation improvements. We've replaced both booster pumps. So we have completely new infrastructure, and that was sort of the big thing. Uh, we get a lot of complaints, obviously, from the public about the appearance of the grass well before we can fix the surface we really need to fix what's underneath the ground and that's all the irrigation and another big improvement for woodlawn is we have contracted directly with par 3 landscaping as of october 1 and they have been helping most of this work over the last year they've been providing us an irrigator weekly so when there's i mean th there's a water issue during the summer nearly every day out here so having them on site weekly allows us to fix those a lot in a much more timely manner. Uh, we also fertilized the entire property this year and we hydro seeded about 10 acres. So there's been a big push on trying to improve the landscaping. And I think over the next couple of summers, it'll really be looking good. One caveat that I wanna mention here on record is you will hear people complain about our grass being dead. It is not dead, it is dormant. It is Bermuda grass. <laughs> Just turns yellow for the winter, it'll be back. And that's kind of it. I'm happy to take any questions at this time. Question, please. I don't so much have a question, but <clears throat> I, I got to tell you, I'm absolutely blown away at what I, what I just saw because um, <clears throat> this area of town uh, takes so much abuse, and it would be easy for the city and you to say, I'm done. Yeah. Go with the easiest solution. And when I hear your... Uh, your uh, tone of voice when you're explaining the, the way you came to your design solutions, it makes me very happy and you should be commended. This is fantastic. Thank you for doing this. Thank you, Commissioner. Please. Good. Excuse me. I need the mic on, please. I thought it was on. Um, 
the building at 1500 for master. Did it get painted? <coughs> the, I, uh, we definitely painted inside. <coughs> we have not painted the exterior yet. I agree, and we can make that happen. <laughs> Still, though, for the record, uh, lots of green grass there. Mm -hmm. uh, any plans to slowly remove that with more water conscious? Uh, thank you for the question, Chair. That's a, a pretty sensitive question with some of the people in the cemetery industry. Uh, we have had a lot of talks about that. Jerry Walker was a, a big fan of the idea of xeriscaping several sections of the cemetery. We do not have it officially in the plans as of yet. I have talked with the, the cemetery operator, which is Bunker's Funeral Group, which is also um, local to the downtown area. Their other cemeteries have done things like this. Uh, it does not necessarily always go well, but I think here in the city of Las Vegas, we can push that initiative considering the circumstances with our water. One of the ideas to do so is to zero escape the oldest section of the cemetery, which is along Las Vegas Boulevard. Okay. And the reason for that idea is because it is the least visited by families it would most likely receive the least amount of kickback from the families. So we don't have that officially in the works, but the, those, they, it is being discussed. Uh, uh, part of the reason I ask that is, is a couple of decades ago, when the city of Las Vegas was fixing the street at Bruce and Owen, uh, as they were digging down, they found caskets that had, because there's an aquifer there, and then with all the water we're dumping onto it, it was just pushing the, the caskets and the remains further, further east, almost northeast. Uh, I would suggest that, that, that we possibly, you know, the cemetery industry is going to have to get a little bit modern uh, in, in certainly in southern Nevada, and that's a beautiful lawn, but what, what you're going to put in desert landscaping is also beautiful. So I, I, uh, I would encourage, because the, the, we're also spending a lot of water dollars to, to, to water that land. So that's my only really, real comment, other than to echo the, the amount of time and, and and I do detect it in your voice. There is not, oh, we got to do this. It's more of, this is, we're, we're, we're going to move this forward. So thank you for all that. Thoughts, comments? Please. Uh, did they plan to put some security cameras or any kind of uh, main security to be watched from the office out or? Uh, yes, Commissioner. Actually, uh, one, one of the issues at Woodlawn is, <laughs> technology for one uh, and the infrastructure for that technology. We've had a couple meetings with IT and vendors about installing various forms of security cameras in the area. It's de definitely needed. Uh, for a short time we did have one of those mobile uh, police cameras that you kind of see like in the parking lot at, at like a grocery store. I'm not 100% sure what it's called. <laughs> That's the official name I'm giving it though. Uh, we did have one of those. We are actually in the middle of trying to get wi uh, internet and Wi-Fi installed at the cemetery, which will, I think, open up some of those opportunities. There have been talks about hiring, contracting security at the cemetery. Uh, last August in 2021, we actually started closing the cemetery at night. It used to be a 24-7, 365 operation. Uh, we became the first cemetery in town to close overnight. A lot of people said uh, that would not be well received. It has been well received. Uh, so we now close at 8 p.m. and we open it up around 5.30 to 6. So that has helped quite a bit. And then uh, obviously just having a city presence there all the time now, we have a full-time employee there. Uh, that helps tremendously. But a as of this time, uh, we're not planning to hire security full-time. Um, as of right now, over the past 12 months, as I mentioned earlier, things have really stabilized out there, so I'm not sure it's necessary at this point. But we've also made significant improvements on some fencing features, uh, especially in the maintenance yard. Um, some other kind of security improvements to sort of help with prevent those tampons, those people breaking in. 
And then uh, another big thing we did was vehicles cause quite a bit of damage out there, uh, especially at night, especially with alcohol or other subjects of interest that people like to partake in. But uh, we installed a significant number of boulders and traffic signage throughout the property as well as speed bumps to help because uh, every time I'm there, I used to see people speeding quite a bit throughout the property. So we kind of made some of those improvements. And there have been significant improvements since some of those installments. Thank you. Dr. Seabrand, anything else? No, I have nothing to add. Thank you. Great. I appreciate it. Look forward to any, uh, any additional updates on the, uh, on the property. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Let's move on to agenda item 22-0690 HPC1. No, we're going to move on to 22-0691 HPC1, uh, a report regarding the future plans of the former El Portel Theater located at 310 East Fremont Street, Dr. Seabrand. Thank you, Seabrand, for the record. So the El Portel, the last time we heard, this board heard a report on that was in October of 2021. Um, as a reminder, this building is not on any historic registers. However, it is of historic age. And during our last report, we heard about the proposed um, future for, for this building and what it was going to be used for. and. Mr. Palacio is here to give us an update since we last heard from the um, leasers in 2021. A quick question for the city attorney's office. Uh, the, uh, the, the speaker moves from the position of a board member to a presenter. Uh, this is not an action item, but is there anything we need to Is there a process of, of transition that we need to make formal other than just announce it? No, I believe just the announcement is sufficient. Just that you, this is just not an item that there is any action to Okay, great. Welcome, and please identify yourself for the record. Craig Palacios, Bunnyfish Studio, 208 South Maryland Parkway, uh, re representing my clients who have purchased the L Portel, or are, are leasing out and, and um, substantially renovating the El Portel. Um, I was approached several months ago uh, uh, to be the architect for this renovation that th this client is doing. The use of the project is going to be something like a, 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 an arcade, like a, a Dave and Buster's. Um, they're uh, spending a tremendous amount of money on, on uh, games that are oriented towards grown-ups. So you've all seen the... Um, uh, the game where the claw goes down and you try to get the prizes out. In this case, they will harness you in a harness and put you on a crane and uh, somebody else will lower you down. You'll try to get things like high-end sneakers and bags and things like this. Has uh, wine and beer for the moment, some snacks like you might get at, you know, at a, like a carnival, you know, hot dogs and things like that, chicken wings. Um, they have, since I met them, had a commitment to uh, preserving the importance of this building. And uh, this is what it currently looks like, if everybody can see. If we can go to the next page, I'll show you what I proposed to them for. Gotcha. So um, when I, yeah, when I, let's see, when I get to my final, uh, uh, so, <clears throat> this is what I proposed to them, and this is what, what came before the city. Um, after this presentation, and it's basically leaving the building exactly the way it is, uh, they brought in an operator. So yeah, so original, original si signage, uh, new windows that look like the old ones, and then they did request to remove the lower portion of the, underneath the windows. So here you can see them installed and they asked to have them removed and bring this down so that people can walk in from the street. After this conversation happened, they brought in an operator and the operator uh, has these uh, sort of grown up arcades all over the country. And fortunately or unfortunately, this is what their branding looks like. So what I'm gonna show you is, is gonna be shocking. 
Um, and it took me a little bit of time to uh, get on board with it. But really, the way they explained it to me is that we're dealing with paint and LEDs that attach to the side, and that if anybody ever wanted this building to look like this again, they would just remove the paint and remove the LEDs. So take a deep breath. Ta -da. So this is what uh, my client would like to do to their, their, this building, the El Portel. And again, at first it took me, took me a little bit aback. And then once I started to uh, reason with them on it, really what we're dealing with is uh, preserving the, uh, the structure, the roof, the openings, still doing uh, new windows that look like the old windows, um, keeping the marquee, and then adding paint and uh, LEDs applied to the side and a stealth standing structure that stands within the doorway. Um, it's not a historical building. We don't have to go before Shippo. Um, again, my client has, uh, since I've been working with them, had a commitment to keeping the building as is and um, asked me to come here and present this to you um, as a, um, uh, you know, out of respect for, for your group and hope that you can see the logic here and we'll uh, put up with it. Questions, comments? Please. Uh, Palancar, for the record. I'm glad that you maintained the actual building. I think that looks great, but I, I'm still confused on that slanted structure in the center. What was the purpose? Is that just to show that it's kind of a crazy place inside? Or? Yeah, it's art. It'll be a, um, a, a square uh, arch that goes up and over, doesn't attach to the building, is, is yeah. independent, and have LED d lights that change colors. And yeah, exactly what you said, show this crazy fun place to come into. Uh, probably will elicit uh, uh, social media photos and um, attract people in that might just keep walking by because it is something new and interesting. Okay, I like it. Still off for the record first, thank you for the courtesy of bringing this before. Again, this is not something we can vote on. It's not on the city register or the state register or, or, or the national register. That said, it is, is one of the most historic sites still remaining on Fremont Street. It was the first talkie in, in town in 1928. Uh, it was clearly state of the art. All these things I think you know, whether it was the air conditioning uh, uh, and, and the fact that you, know, you could uh, hear movies, uh, the, the sound of, of, of movies. Um, that said, just a couple quick comments. Uh, the phrase original, I just drop that because that's not, those are not original. Uh, nothing, that, that sign is not original. Uh, okay. uh, it's just, uh, there, was, there was a sign that was on the right hand, what was left of the, the sign was on the right hand side of the building. You're um, right. It's it's uh, it's old and historical, but not the original. Yeah. What's 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 nice? What's still sort of left are the uh, the upper floor, to some degree. Although that was really like a patio. Those were law offices behind there on the on the second floor. Um, uh, if you squint, you can still see the historic building that's there. My last question or comments or thoughts are, are what's the interior plan because it, the ceiling of the roof part of it was was that was part of the art of that building as well as what used to be the windows on, on, on both sides. I haven't been in there in a couple of years, a few years. So it's in awful shape. You know, it's been a number of things over the years and most recently it's just been empty. Um, but the, the roof is, the ceiling is intact, okay. and the in, we have to bring in fire sprinklers per code, so there'll be, there'll be penetrations in the ceiling, but uh, the aesthetics of the ceiling is gonna stay the same. Okay. And the, uh, the signage boxes on the walls will either be what's left of them covered and left in place, okay. or be used with a new LED in the place of what used to be the sign, and with the, the, the light bulbs reinstalled probably in LED. Yeah, and when it was built, it was standalone. There were no buildings on either side, so those were, were in fact. Is the air conditioning unit still back? So 
We, we understand, we, I was told that it, they have the air conditioning units. I'm not sure how many there were. Um, we have not been able to locate them on site. Okay. Right. Okay. So okay. there's, what happens is there's a, um, a mezzanine in the front, which is where these windows are, and then the volume goes up uh, very high, like 25 feet. And then above that, there's uh, about four or five feet in, in between the ceiling and the roof. And there's a bunch of garbage in there. We think the air conditioning units still live in there because you can see where the ductwork comes down. But uh, I'm not going in there. Okay. And, um, do you, you mean know. historic artifacts or do garbage? <laughs> What's that? No, I was being facetious. Do you mean historic artifacts or garbage? No, there's garbage and okay. probably, hopefully some historical uh, <laughs> items as well. Now, what was cool that we found is in the um, in the uh, fly loft where the where the uh, curtain goes up. Yeah. All of the uh, riggings are still up there, yeah. and the little pieces of wood that you put in place to hold it at certain levels. So that's kind of just been, you know, it's it's encapsulated and it's just there. My well, last question is there was a plaque on this building on the outside letting the public know it's a historic building. I don't know if it's still there or not, but I can find out. It, it, see for the record, it is. Last time I was there, it's still there. It's still there. Okay. Uh, again, we don't have any authority in this area, but I would hope you'd pass along that it would be nice if that was kept. That'll stay. I can, I can assure you of that. Um, well, I have a question. At some point, we're going to go into demolition of certain parts of the building, um, and that's the point where they'll have either scaffolding or uh, some sort of lift to get up in that space. What would happen if we found those air conditionings? Does anybody want them? Uh, uh, th th we'll start with the answers being yes, and then the question is, is who? Uh, the city doesn't have a, a facility to store historic artifacts other than the, the, its warehouse which is not really a museum per se. UNLV doesn't hold three-dimensional artifacts, so that would really leave uh, uh, the State Museum, uh, Hollis Gillespie, who's a member of, of this group. So uh, the, the first is, is to see what it is, if it is garbage. Uh, uh, but even pieces of paper that would go back to 30, the 1930s or whatever could preserve some of the history. So. Uh, I, I, I'm trying to think of what, what, what do you think that would take place? March or April? Uh, let, let me, if, unless there's somebody else, uh, Dr. Seagrant, or, or uh, let, let me check with, uh, with Hollis and maybe we get the two of you together and, and uh, I'd certainly be more than happy to help, okay. like going through garbage. Cool. Further questions, comments? Great, thank you very much and, and, and thank you El Portel for, for bringing this, uh, uh, the presentation to, to this board. I really appreciate that. Thank you guys. Is Dr. Seabrand anything else before we move on? No. Okay. Let's move on to item 922-0692-HPC1. Report by the Community Development Department regarding the Historic Preservation Commission budget. Okay, thank you, Seabrent, for the record. So for our budget, so we did have meetings with our finance department to make sure that we have everything um, accurate, and, and we do. We had very long meetings with them, and so just concentrating on this year right now is what we're going to be doing and moving forward. So what the commission has spent from, and it's January to June because the finance operates by the fiscal year. So from January to June of 2022, this commission has spent in small grants just over $5,000. Um, and those have been to mostly the NEON Museum. Um, our operational expenses, and that includes all of the memberships and our trainings, the plaques that we've created for our historic buildings. That's just over $2,000. And for the strategic outreach that we're working on, that's just over $800. For fiscal year 2023, again, because this is how finance operates on the fiscal year, and that would be July to June of um, to 2023, 
the small grants so far is $10,000, operational expenses just over 1,000, and strategic outreach is uh, just over 700. And so just to give you an idea of what the totals are, so totals from January 1st to present is just over $20,000 of what this commission has spent. Again, a breakdown there, 15 for small grants, over 3,000 for operational, and over 1,000 for strategic outreach. So this means that right now what is remaining in the budget for the HPC is $118,979. $118, now this is the monies that this commission has received as grants from the Centennial Commission. So we basically have two pots of, of, of money. We have this pot of what we just call our administrative expenses and that is what we have left is 118,000. Now I know everybody's gonna ask about what about all of our grants, our federal grants, and our federal grants come from both the State Historic Preservation Office as well as the National Park Service. And so for the federal grants that have been completed so far, we had the survey catalog that was completed for 30,000 um, and the, the travel for the, the forum in July um, was uh, just over 9,000. And what we have in progress is the west side, the east side, and Charleston Heights surveys. And those are all totaling 118. Those, that, those are some of that, th that's all still has to be paid. But so just so everybody understands, the way that our federal grants work, when we, when we apply for the federal grant and that's awarded to us, and these are all reimbursement grants, the, when we pay the consultant, the city fronts us that money, and then when we get the reimbursement from either federal entity, then that goes back into the city's funds. So again, we basically have two funds. As far as thinking about all of our federal grants, that's, that's all taken care of, and it's not something that should be really considered as far as do we have money in there, because yes, we do. And the one that you want to focus on is any spending outside of the federal grant surveys, and that right now, again, is over $118,000. So, happy to take, take questions. So, for the record, so they're both $118,000 just coincidental. It, it's really odd, isn't it? I know, I checked with Teresa like three times to make sure it was correct, and yeah, it came out that way. It's, it is odd. Questions? Quick question on the, uh, uh, the grants uh, for the neighborhood surveys, uh, East Side, West Side, and, and Charleston Heights. Those are were, those were federal grants. Uh, and then the Centennial Commission has an additional neighborhood grant for the Biltmore neighborhood. With those four uh, being done either by federal or, or, or Centennial funds, is the Department of, what is the department called now? I forgot. You mean us? Uh, Your department. Oh, we're, we are now on um, community development. <laughs> uh, the community development. Are there other recommendations that the community development department would have for additional neighborhoods that that we should survey using some of this hundred and eighteen thousand dollars? Yes, of course. So we work. Well, Mike's obviously on our board, but he's also uh, one of the planning managers, and so we work very closely with Mike to find out what they're doing in the planning and like our. Um, Rafael Rivera and West Side Surveys, those are, and that's the East Side Survey, Rafael Rivera, um, those correlate very closely with what planning is doing in some of those neighborhoods. Um, and we are always looking for more surveys to do, and now that we have our survey catalog, we can look at that survey catalog and we see where there's gaps in what we need to fill in, but also to maybe revisit some of those to determine this is quite an old survey, so we also want to um, resurvey that, just do a, a quick update on that. And so yes, we can take that, we can hire a consultant with the money out of that 818,000. So was, I guess it was really two parts. The answer the second part, we can use that money for the, for, for the research project. But it seemed to me that, that when we got the final catalog, there were any number of recommendations in there that this should be a, a, up, updated. Uh, how is the priority, I mean, I think there was just a lot, because uh, 
how is the priority determined? Is it strictly just by the development department and what coincides with, with their needs? Or is it, can it also be just something that this is a historic neighborhood, like for instance, John S. Park, and we want to update that survey? It's, a, it's everything. Um, you know, we're having to take, obviously, recommendations from this board. Um, and also from our catalog, it, you're right, it's, it seems like almost half of those surveys need to be updated. Yeah. So how to prioritize those, that's something that we're trying to work on right now. Is, is that catalog online yet? No. Any future for that? The reason I was asking, then the board could take a look at that catalog online and, and maybe come back with some ideas. We can, if, if it's, we can't get it online, just let us know. We're, we're happy to send it to everybody. Um, it is also in our, online in our uh, meetings um, website. I can't remember what day, which date it was that we presented the final catalog, but the date that the final catalog oh, was, that's right. okay. was presented. So it is online. Yeah, yeah, it is online, but it's not on our website as far as like our history website, but it is on the, okay. the website where the meetings and agendas um, portal is located. Yeah, well, I mean, we have, uh, we, I think also part of what you're saying is we don't need to go to the Centennial Commission currently to ask for additional funding since we have $118,000. That is correct. I think it would be ill-advised to ask them for another 75000 when we have 118000 I think we need to spend that money this coming year and we can do more surveys. We can also look at doing some more nominations to the national and, and our local register. And um, once we do get that number down, then go back to Centennial um, the following year. And then my last question, though, is, is as part of the process, though, we can all say, let's f do this and vote for it in favor and then just dump it uh, on, onto your shoulders. Uh, is, is there, uh, with the ones that are in play, the four that we mentioned, through either Centennial or, or here, when would you anticipate them being finished as far as your office is concerned? Well, I have a list right here. Oh, okay. So for the Biltmore Village bungalows, I'm sorry, I know you don't like to call it bungalows, but that's the name. Uh, that the final report will be released. Again, this, I'm giving you just the final report dates. This is, does not take into account the drafts and then the rewrites and the edits and everything. So Biltmore Village is March 27th of 2023. The Charleston Heights survey is June 1st, 2023. The West Side survey, that is going to be August 31st, 2023. And we may get that one just a bit sooner than that. Uh, the East Side survey, also known as the Rafael Rivera survey, that one is February 28th, 2024. And then we do have the one pending of the Twin Lake survey, and this is the one that I was just speaking to SHPO yesterday. They still need to send us the contract on that. So this date may change depending on the consultant that we hire, but it's estimated uh, March 27th, 2024. And Charleston Heights, did you mention that one? Yes, Yes, Charleston Heights is... Uh, June 1st, 2023. Oh, got it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Further questions, comments? I mean, and there are, are there any question neighborhoods right now uh, or areas that are bubbling up to the top of the list? For a survey? Surveyed, yeah. Mike? We're looking, yeah, so looking at the Northwest, again, we're trying to look at those areas because the, the downtown area has been so heavily surveyed. We're trying to look at, as the city expanded going into the 50s and 60s, we're trying to look at those areas a little bit closer. Okay. Although some for the downtown area are pretty outdated and lots of change and buildings are gone, so. Yes, and that is why we will be looking at some of those as well. Yeah, it would, it would help. I'm sure we can all do it, but if, if maybe your office could send out the date that this meeting approved the catalog because that's where the catalog is online. Yes. 
right? That is correct. And Teresa will send everybody that information in the link, and then you just go into the link, and then you go into the backup, and you can read it. Okay. Further questions, comments? Uh, Commissioner Surface, I just want to thank you, Dr. Sebrant, Teresa, and Michael, for all your hard work in putting this together and keeping us on good footing for the future. Thanks again. Let us move then on to the next item, which is 10 22-0693-HPC1, discussion regarding planning strategies for May 2023 Historic Preservation Month, the entire month. Dr. Sebrant. Okay, so thank you, Sebrant, for the record. So Teresa and I brainstormed this um, and came up with um, an idea that during our Historic Preservation Month, well, it's a nationwide celebration in May of, May of every year, we always do our plaques, which is, is great to recognize individuals for their contributions to historic preservation. But that's all we do. And so we think we need to expand on that and do a little bit more and try and celebrate not just on the date of our meeting in May, but to actually celebrate the entire month of May is Historic Preservation Month. And so some of the ideas that we came up with, and this, again, this is just a discussion item right now, and we welcome everybody's feedback of some of these ideas of, of that we're kind of bouncing around. Um, so everybody knows that it was established in 1973 by the National Trust for Historic Preservation, and as we do mo move forward in time, I think people are more aware of what historic preservation is and are more um, interested in engaging in historic preservation activities which is also now a good time to, to make our program a bit more robust. So our goals, of course, are to create community awareness and interact with people in Las Vegas that are or are not aware that the, we exist and that our historic preservation initiatives, what they actually bring about. And they do create, we want to create those positive relationships between us and, and all of those residents in historic areas or just in Las Vegas. So thinking about some activities, um, we have a few slides that go into this more depth, but just real quickly, a homeowner's fair, neighborhood cleanups, uh, photo exhibitions. Of course, we always have our film premieres during May, which I guess I should say, I, let me go back and amend what I said. We don't just do the plaques, we do the plaques and the movies. Um, we have our awards and um, we're thinking of adding a luncheon to that and adding social media campaigns. So as far as homeowners resources fair, it would be great to partner with our neighborhood assistance program as well as code enforcement because those of you have attended any of our neighborhood meetings, inevitably the questions arise about code enforcement issues, um, law enforcement issues, and so it's always good to partner with our, the other departments within the city. And if we had some type of a resource fair, we could talk about pulling permits for uh, within the historic district as far as what is a certificate of appropriateness, the application process, how we can uh, assist with that, talk more about our bricks and mortars grants applications, um, demonstrations of small DIY home projects, of course, on historic buildings and historic residences to ensure that they do, um, do everything uh, within the um, secretary standards that are required as part of our certificate of appropriateness. And then even looking at even partnering with some of the other CLGs and jurisdictions, I have been in contact with um, some of the staff up in Boulder City, and they are interested in, I think we have a more robust program that they do, and they would be interested in maybe partnering with us as for some other things. There is a shift program, and that is the program that helps with the um, homeless issues throughout the city, and that again would be a good partnership and any type of other li licensed professional booths that we could envision having some type of an affair that would help um, that would help people understand what they can and cannot do to their property uh, both historically and non-historically uh, looking at neighborhood cleanups again uh, partnering with our neighborhood services do local cleanups in our national historic districts um, looking at an art and photo exhibition of then and now images, you know, the image of what the Woodlawn Cemetery, for instance, looked like then, what it looks like now, and other buildings that are on our historic register, um, also on the endangered list that this commission came up with, um, also just uh, historic aged buildings. And then, of course, we do have our 1950s 
a film premiere um, that is going to be May 13th of 2023, and that is the 1950s, and that is uh, funded by our Centennial Commission. So that's another idea of, of maybe even having some art exhibits within the gallery of City Hall and also the venue that we eventually choose for the premiere. And then this, the, this idea basically started with this one of after our Historic Preservation Month Awards that we have a luncheon. Um, we can have it here at our now cafe. It's on this floor. Um, that it would be an invite for obviously the people that have been awarded the awards that for that month. But we also are able, can, if we can get a hold of the past recipients of who have received an award, also past commissioners who have been on this board to invite everybody. Again, we would have on display all of, all of our before and after pictures. Um, and we could do a nice catering with uh, Rachel's Kitchen. We actually just had nice catering from them and they offer a really nice venue or a really nice uh, variety of sandwiches and salads. And that would only cost about $1,800. Of course, that would have to come out of the commission's budget of your 118000 in order to do a luncheon after our awards. And then our social media campaigns, we would work with our communications department on this. Um, we could have weekly historical facts that they would tweet out on Twitter and Facebook and um, I don't know if they're on Instagram, whatever other social media that, that the city puts out to engage with the public. And again, going back to the National Preservation Month, they have a campaign called This Place Matters and looking at visiting historic places, taking a photograph of yourself at these historic places, and let us know what do you think of those historic places. And again, this would all be like a, a, a driven by, by Twitter and, and Facebook. So those are ideas, again, where this isn't a vote item, where we haven't, this, none, of, none of this is set in concrete, but would welcome any feedback of um, what this commission feels about that. Thoughts or questions, comments? Uh, yeah, Commissioner Surface, I think that the ideas are excellent. And uh, Dr. Seaburn, just um, my own personal experience, uh, as you well know, I'm real active uh, with the Urban Land Institute, and we fell on some uh, significant fiscal challenges in the past. And we did a placemaking awards program where uh, we recognized folks at a luncheon uh, for placemaking here in the city of Las Vegas and the county as well. And I think this, the, the luncheon idea is excellent, but I think you could even take it a step further and possibly uh, sell tickets to the luncheon and have uh, the folks that are receiving the award maybe talk about the history or uh, the preservation of a particular uh, uh, item and make it uh, kind of a an annual event, that type of thing. And, uh, but you could seed it with you know, our budget, but it's just uh, some idea that, that it adds prestige to it, and it could be like an annual event. Uh, we started out with about oh, 50 people attending placemaking awards. This past year, we had 260. And we, uh, I, I don't know if that's a conflict at all money-wise or things like that, but just something to think about. Okay, thank you. I'm not sure we could do that by selling tickets, but we'll verify that. I'm wondering if, uh, Cheryl Perdue, um, I'm wondering if we couldn't in some way um, take clips from some of the films that have been commercially made about Las Vegas that a lot of outsiders are aware of and um, for instance, Viva Las Vegas, or Ocean's Eleven, or Hangover, uh, where you could maybe clip some of the particularly iconic uh, scenic um, moments within the film, not the storyline, but how the city was a backdrop for the movies that uh, could be collaged together and maybe used at um, a luncheon, just um, or even as possibly um, little 30-second features uh, of spots on the internet. Uh, one other thing I have thought of is we don't have any kind of a scenic drive in this town, but we could possibly long-term think about a historical drive. A lot of people who come to Las Vegas know nothing about our city, and I think if we 
this isn't something that we could do by spring of 2023, but it's something that long-term could be something very interesting and utilized by groups that um, um, conduct tours of our city or people could self-drive it. I think it could be extremely interesting. Okay, thank you. I, I don't know if we can use movie clips. That is an intellectual property um, issue. However, we do have all our movies, all of our documentaries. We could certainly put together clips of that. And we actually do have a scenic drive. We have the only scenic byway through the city of Las Vegas. It's along Las Vegas Boulevard. We are right now doing those improvements on the Las Vegas Boulevard Improvement Project. And that is where all of the signs, uh, the neon signs are located that we're moving into the median. So um, we do have a scenic drive and uh, yeah, we can perhaps film the scenic drive and add that as well. So thank you. I, th I think a lot of, the, still not for the record, a lot of the uh, things that are being suggested is, uh, going, for example, we do have a scenic drive. But I would suggest that most of the population is, is not aware of that. So a real opportunity for the city's commercial or commercial uh, uh, communication office to, uh, uh, and and I would, you know, there's there's always challenges with historic preservation and saving buildings and so forth. But and that's what we do. Uh, but the city of Las Vegas stands out amongst. <coughs> all the cities and communities in the state of Nevada with the amount of money and the amount of tension it, it spends on historic preservation, historic education. Nobody else has something like the Centennial Commission that spends millions of dollars and has spent tens of millions of dollars. And, and they need to be brought into this into this celebration for all, for all the work that, the, that they are doing on behalf of the, of the city of Las Vegas, as well as, as the Historic Preservation Commission. I mean, there's a whole list of things that, that, that can be done. Uh, I, I would hope that at the top of the list is community outreach. And the community outreach, both in the sense of these are, here's the scenic byway, these are historic buildings, here's the Pioneer Trail, reaffirming all the things that, that, that are in existence, plus the value of historic presentation, of preservation with, with, with neighborhoods. When's the home and history tour going to be done by the Nevada Preservation Foundation? I, it's April, mid to late April. I don't remember the exact dates of next year. So it's a month before the May celebration? Yes. Okay. Are we going to do a parade? Of course, yes. All right. I mean, <laughs> so we've got a movie, we've got plaques, we've got a parade. Um, as I mentioned before, I would hope we could contact Jay Dapper. When he made his presentation, he was going to put a light, uh, light up the top of the Huntridge. Maybe he can hold that off until May, and we can put the plaque for him uh, and, and, and do that uh, in, in, in May. Uh, and there's several reports. You mentioned, I think, the, the Biltmore. That's going to come out in May, an interesting neighborhood. I, just, I think it, there, there needs to be an opportunity for the city, not to pat itself on the back, but here are some of the things that the city has done, is doing. Uh, uh, Woodlawn Cemetery. I mean, by, by May of next year, you're going to have that pretty well buffed up and, and, uh, uh, and, and clean. So I have a lot of great examples about what the city is, is, is doing. So I, I think that anybody that has an idea we just should send it to your office. And then my last question is, once you get this list of 100 things to do and narrow it down uh, to reality, uh, uh, the, it's a ladder uh, in the uh, fixing a light. Um, will you bring that back to, the, to, to this commission for approval? Or how what's the process to say, we're going to do this, 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 and this? Right, and so thank you for your comments. And we definitely will include the projects that the Centennial Commission has funded, absolutely. Okay. So we will get a hold of those recipients. And if it's a tangible result to show that, if it's intangible, we'll have to figure out how we're going to display that. Okay. But absolutely, we want to include them. So yes, we will narrow this down because we will need to have a budget. And then we will come back to this commission for approval on that. Okay, one, one last I just made a note for myself. It, do we need, I know there's a real challenge with updating the, 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 the city's website, 
but I was wondering if we could spend some of this $118,000 to hire somebody to, to flush out and add some new elements to the city's timeline. Because uh, it's kind of... I think, so, see for the record, I, I know we had this conversation before, and I think there's an issue with having an outside entity accessing the city's um, website as I recall, but I'd have to go back and look at it. But that, that is the problem, is because we have to have a city person or city staff to, to do the updates. Okay, all right. Further questions, comments, thoughts? If not, if you got a great idea, or even a not so great idea, send it to, <laughs> uh, to Diane C. Rent, and we'll, we will move forward uh, with, uh, with a great celebration in May. I want to, well, one last note. Our nominations, this commission tends to be a little, trying to find a diplomatically, we tend to be a little bit lax and late in, in the nominations. I was wondering if we could have a presentation in February from your office that here's the past winners, here's the deadline, here's some ideas, just something that to remind this board we need to get our act together and send you nominations for the awards, which are probably due by April? No. So they're due by April 19th. So everybody right now, just as a reminder, thank you, Chairman Stoddle, think of who has done an incredible project, who has done incredible work, who has contributed greatly to historic preservation. If that person is able, or that you want to nominate that person or people or a business or whatever it happens to be for a one of our historic preservation awards. So yes, start thinking about it. But yeah, we can do a report in February. But I would like to get those nominations before February, or at least get them February, March at the very, very latest. Well, let's move to January, and maybe we can send out next week uh, the, the categories as, as as a reminder uh, of what what categories we. Um, it's Christmas next week, and a lot of people are off, so can we wait till the beginning of the year? I think you wait for whatever you think is appropriate, but I'm just trying to get, uh, get something on the, that the board can think about. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. I didn't know people got Christmas off. Um, all right. <laughs> Let's then move on to 1122-0694-HPC1, uh, report by the Community Development Department regarding director's updates. Dr. Seabrand? Uh, thank you. So, Director Floyd is not here today. Um, Mike, did you have anything? We have nothing. All right, then let's move on to the next item, uh, which is item number 12, 22-0695, HPC1, report by the Community Development Department regarding project updates list. That's in your board packet. Uh, so thank you, Seabrent, for the record. So I pretty much gave everybody, <coughs> excuse me, an update. Let's hold on one minute. <clears throat> on all of our surveys. And the only other update we have is <clears throat> the NAMI, sorry, I have to put this on for a second, sorry. <clears throat> so the only other update we have is the NEA Museum did complete their uh, panels for their boneyard, and they will be giving their report at our January meeting. Now, this is the most important update that we have. Our own chairman, Bob Stodel, is December's Citizen of the Month, and he was also given a key to the city, which is very rare and very well deserved. And so I think that I would just like to um, recognize Chairman Stodel by um, a show of applause. I was surprised, uh, other than, than I got the word ahead of time, but I was surprised at the, uh, uh, the amount of time that, uh, that this process spends, and the mayor was very nice. Uh, and it was, a, it was a full house, largely because right before was uh, the swearing-in ceremony of the brand new, newly elected. Uh, uh, so when I looked around and said, oh, this is all for me, turns out, <laughs> Turns out there were some other more important things that were on the, on the agenda, but it was uh, it was a very nice and, and a very appreciative of, of the mayor and the council and and, and the and the process of, of, of doing that. And uh, uh, so thank you very much. Well, it's well deserved, very well deserved. So thank you, Commissioner Surface. Just for the record, uh, 
Bob did an excellent job of uh, putting the commission in the forefront, and Teresa and Dr. Siebert and Michael uh, fully recognized all of the staff's efforts. Uh, we were just uh, put out in a very, very nice way in front of the city council and all those people there. So kudos to you, Bob, and to you, staff, for uh, putting us in such a nice limelight. Well, thank you very much. It is, it is actually always nice to get um, feedback from um, council members and our mayor's office that they um, obviously do recognize um, our historic preservation effort. So and thank you for Bob for also bringing that to the forefront. Well, it's a large, large city and a lot of departments and uh, uh, the focus was historic preservation. So yeah. we're going to make sure we can make the most of it. So. Uh, Okay, so I do have more. more? Yes. <laughs> I, uh, moving on. Uh, so remember there was the Pass Forward Conference and the attendees, you still have access to all those recordings until the end of February. So if you were not able to watch those um, webinars, then you can watch them up until the end of February. Some of them were really good, some of them were okay, but it's, it's well worth your time. I also did want to mention that everybody should still be receiving emails from the National Alliance for Preservation Commissions, and they have been offering a lot of free uh, webinars. Well, I mean, we pay our membership, that's part of our membership, but it doesn't cost an ever extra fee. And this past, uh, what was it, December 8th, they had an excellent, excellent webinar at Mid Century Housing. And I'm, unfortunately, Commissioner Laramie's not here, but they had a fantastic overview on conservation districts. So if you weren't able to watch that, is that still available to them? I don't know if it's still available. If it's not, we'll, we'll check, but you know, just watch for those emails because some of these free webinars are, are fantastic. Uh, then the C Click Fix reporting option, it is now live for Las Vegas, and this is mostly code enforcement, but we just want to make the this uh, commission aware of it, that it is, if you are going to call 311 instead of 911, that you can use this. I have not used it. I don't know how simple or how difficult it is to use, but it is now live for everybody to, to start using. Uh, I would suggest just for the record that we have this. I know the city was working on it, but this commission and the comments that uh, have been made over the last period of time uh, help move this this forward as well for our historic neighborhood. So uh, this is a, a real move forward. Thank you. Of course. Well, it wasn't us. It was um, other departments within the city. But thank you to the city. <laughs> and then we have uh, there was a a news release, a press release about the a master plan for the new African American Museum and Cultural Center in the historic West Side is moving forward right now. It is in the master planning stages. And those stages do include analyzing the environment for the arts and cultural needs. Um, there, of course, gonna, is going to be community and stakeholder engagement, content for the museum, establishing its vision, uh, financial and operational plans, their fundraising strategies, uh, and how to implement, implement this. This board isn't really involved in this. This is our, um, our cultural affairs and our part of the, the 100 plan. And the 100 Plan website, you can find more about this museum if you want to learn more about it by uh, visiting that, the website. Just go to 100 Plan in our, type in 100 Plan in the city's website and that will give you um, the, the, not the master plan, but the idea of to get the master plan moving forward. And once the master plan is implemented, then it would be available and it would go on to its next step. Has the, has the website been updated recently? Or, or? I honestly don't know. I'm sorry. Is it not? Have you tried to look at it? Is it not there? Well, I mean, the hundred plan's been around for a long, long time. I was wondering what's 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 fresh on it, and is there a, any elements of this proposed museum and cultural center uh, uh, on that website, or is it just the, the I don't want to I don't want to sound negative, but is it just the old hundred plan? I honestly don't know. Okay, all right, okay. And I, and I would hope, because there's two words in there that's at the very first paragraph, museum and historic, that this board, even though it's not going to likely have any sort of vote, but that we uh, uh, stay up to date on that, and it would be nice to see a draft. Um, uh, who, who's, who's, 
who, what organization is going to say, okay, well, this is the draft, we accept this draft? Is that the city council? So for the record, Michael Howe, um, in charge of the, the museum RFP right now is cultural affairs. So Maggie Plaster would be able to address those questions. Okay. And it's, it's at its nascent stage. I mean, we're still, we're moving forward with a consultant to still come up with the program. We still need the site. There's still a lot of work to be completed. But the, the 100 plan, that was something the city council adopted, correct? Correct, and this is probably like one of the steps of multiple components of the 100 plan. So we have the 100 plan as a, as a plan for the historic Westside District, and then from that tier we've prioritized those, and that's where you have the 100 plan in action. And then the African American Museum is, is a component of that 100 plan in action Great. series. Right, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. It's just Mike's been working on this for a year, so he's more familiar <laughs> with it than I am. And But just to answer your question, yes, we will have somebody from Cultural Affairs update you. This is why I have it as an update, because it's the first update. Great. But I, we don't have anything on this. But once we do, we will invite Cultural Affairs to give everybody a report. Thank so thank you. you, Mike. And then the last thing um, is to say happy holidays to everybody, however you celebrate. And hope everybody has a safe and um, happy new year as well. 1964? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> That's Snow. a great shot. Yeah, it is. And happy to answer questions, but I think, did we answer questions as we went? Looks like Craig has a question. Further questions, comments, please? Thoughts? All right, then let's move on to the next one, which is uh, 13, uh, HPC 22-0696, HPC 1. Uh, Excuse reports me. in the media on historic uh, and architectural resources in uh, the local media. Uh, it's all part of your board packet, please. Your mic, please. Oh, I thought I turned it on. The printing press. Would you like me to repeat that, or are we okay? I can repeat it. So this is item number 13, 22-0696 HPC1 report by the Community Development Department regarding historic and archaeological resources in the local media. That's in your board packet. Any questions, thoughts? Uh, item 14, 22-0697 HPC1, discussion regarding topics for future agenda items by the Historic Preservation Commission. Are there any topics that you would like? Again, this is not an action item, and the only discussion we would have whether it's appropriate for this commission to, to hear that. Would anybody like to suggest an item for a future meeting? Please. Oh, microphone. No. Nope. Okay. Uh, then let's move on to the last or to item 15, citizen participation. Public comment uh, during this portion of the agenda must be limited to matters within the jurisdiction of the commission. Uh, there is nobody in the audience for public comment, so we can move on to the next item, which is adjournment, and we are adjourned. Thank you all, and thank everybody with the city for their uh, help in moving this forward, especially the city clerk's office.